Here's a few quick photographs hot off the press. We are back at the scene of the crime. Recognise this place, everybody? Yes, St George's Chapel, where crowds are gathered right now. Not for another sham of a wedding, but for the most noble order of the garter. So, first of all, let's admire our sapphire siren, Cathy Cambridge. A cornucopia in cornflower. Isn't she lovely? And we get to see this jolly game of I'm a pink toothbrush or a blue toothbrush with scintillating Sophie. A sweet bun draped in pink icing sugar. Delicious. Big Willie looking quite bashful in his extravagant plume of feathers. And Camilla ready to receive her honour as a companion with proud children Tommy Parker Bells and Laura Lopez looking on. And the Princess Royal dutifully appearing like a much-loved pouch of marbles and tuppence. And there's old Tony Blair. He don't care. We'll come back to the ceremony a bit later on, but let's begin with today's broadcast and welcome to the show. <laughs> oh dear. Poor Prince Bonybum. He's taken a right old tumble, hasn't he? <laughs> Poor Prince Bonnybum. You know what? It's the horse that I feel far more sorry for than Hazelnut because it's not Harry that's going to be saddle sore. It's the horse because he's got to put up with that skin and bones jarring against it all day long. So I'm glad that Harry is okay after taking that tumble, but those poor, poor horses having to cart that carcass around with them. They're the ones where my sympathy truly lies with them. It really does. Anyway, jubilations are in order. More jubilance because yesterday was the day when Her Majesty became the second longest serving monarch in all history, in the whole history of the entire stratosphere. Uh, recently, it was only the other day, wasn't it, when we spoke about her hopping from fourth place into third. And now come, come along, my dear. It's like being at the Epsom Derby. Uh, she's gone into second place. Uh, when she reigned for 70 years and 126 days, as of yesterday, I think it was. She overtook King Bumboyle of Thailand. Good old King Bumboyle. And the one she's got to beat now, come on, my dear, Louis XIV of France is the one to beat. He's in pole position and she's got to go on for another 712 days to beat him because uh, he lasted 72 years and 110 days on the throne. So, uh, yeah, we have that coming up. Can she do 710 more days? Of course she can. And of course she will, my dear. I actually think that, you know, she might reach her Oak Jubilee. I wasn't actually sure what 80 years is. And I looked it up and it's Oak. And how marvellous that would be. Can you imagine? I mean... It's unlikely, I get that, my dears, but it ain't impossible. And the Queen Mum went on till 101. Oh, who's that? <sighs> Always embarrassing. <laughs> but can you imagine the potential beauty of an Oak Jubilee? Just if I was daydreaming for a moment and she were to go on another 10 years, obviously she wouldn't be able to be very present, as it were, unless they laid her out in an oak coffin or something. I jest, my dears. After the splendour of the platinum one, wouldn't it be lovely to just take it down to a nature-based Jubilee where oak and trees and woodland and canopies of leaves are the focus. Wouldn't that be rather wonderful? Elizabeth K. I thought MM's makeup was too heavy for a daytime event. Her makeup artist was really a waste of money. As you said, River, the Queen makes do with just some lippy. Didn't Catherine do her own makeup for her wedding? Probably still does. She always looks flawless. Well, you know, there is some misinformation about Catherine's makeup artist out there. It is a sort of modern myth that she does her own makeup all the time by herself and doesn't rely on anybody else. That's not quite true, but there are some elements of truth to it. She certainly doesn't share any of these pretensions and vulgarity that Meghan seems to display by flying in a makeup artist and a hairstylist simply for the St Paul's Cathedral gig. I mean, that was so unnecessary, it really was. I understand that some people say it's necessary or de rigueur for stars and celebrities to have these kind of entourage, and I understand that that is the way in many circles, but what I don't understand is that they insist that they're not celebrities. They don't want to be celebrities. They want to live as private life as possible in Hollywood. 
Uh, and, you know, they're not working members of the royal family, so they don't have that excuse. Well, she was able to do her makeup and her hair when she was coming up, wasn't she? As a young thing before she got the role in the soap opera. You know, she was able to do it all that time. It doesn't really need that much painting. You know, it's not as if she needs to appear in full drag at every opportunity. But anyway, we, we've gone into that before. But with regards to Catherine, she's been linked to various artists. Hannah Martin, I believe, is one of them. She painted Eugenie on her wedding day, I believe. And Arabella Preston is another one of them. Uh, and I believe that was more in a sort of consultation role. I'm told that she is perfectly capable of doing her own glam and painting her own face, but she does have a small pool of trusted consultants, if you like, that she can call upon if really, really needed in emergencies. But the people that she works with are a discreet carousel of various attendants. And they ain't the types to go scurrying back to social media and, you know, like nutmegs cohorts do and start bragging about, oh, you know, wonderful to meet little Lily, uh, wonderful, you know, just jetted in from Heathrow. You know, it's, they don't broadcast their work and what they're getting up to on social media. You know, it's so vulgar and it's becoming the norm now, but it's certainly not the norm in royal circles. So that's why you don't see and haven't seen anybody that's worked with Kate Middleton in that capacity come back and start reeling off Instagram poses. Oh, just painted the future queen. Who needs drag queens? I've got the real queen. You know, humble bragging. I'm sure some of them might like to. Very good for business. But it's much more discreet than that. And Catherine, while she does do her makeup a lot of the time for herself, especially for day visits, she's more than capable of doing it. You have to understand that she will often employ an extra pair of eyes. And this is very much the domain of Tashi Tashi. And if you haven't heard of her, uh, Natasha Archer has worked in various capacities for the Cambridges, well, Kate specifically, since about 2007, I think. She was employed as a PA, and then she went on to be stylist, dresser, assistant, you know, one of those who takes on a sort of EA role of being that Man Friday, Woman Friday, that's there to help with every eventuality, a trusted confidant that can oversee all these kind of things. Now, someone like Catherine has a wardrobe that needs constant attention, constant preparation, constant laundering, new clothes all the time, but re-wearing, recycling, as they say these da days, you know, just wearing the same outfits, but planning has to go into it for the event, for the occasion, the colour scheme, who the clothes are going to clash with or enhance, you know, for example, the balcony scene with the Queen in bright green and Catherine in pink. You know, these things all have to be considered. And as you've seen, Catherine has a, a super busy diary. So this has to be plotted and planned in advice, uh, in advance, rather. Uh, and uh, Tashi Tashi is one of her chief allies in this respect and will lend a hand where necessary, if necessary, and when she needs an eye to cast over. Uh, so what I'm telling you is that Catherine is not adverse to employing a professional painter or having a helping hand from her assistants, including Tashi Tashi. She's not above all that, but they are used with discretion. It's done with discretion as and when required. She doesn't just think, oh, I'm going to be nipping to the shops and I'm going to pop my face out of a car window. So, ah, oh, call the hairdresser, call the makeup artist, call the whole crew. Uh, you know, I'm Ava Peron, eyes, hair, mouth, figure, glamour, hair, poise, style, movement. You know, I'm... I want to be rainbow high. You know, that is Megan. That is the domain of nutmeg, where she has to feel special, has to feel like this Hollywood star. She never understood, never got the memo that royalty is what every star in the world would aspire to be. Royalty is above all of that Hollywood stardom. It's above all of this trashy celebrity derm, even all of this sort of pseudo-philanthropy and humanitarianism. Above all that, my dears, they could have had it all. But Tash, as you might have seen over the years, has been photographed with the Cambridges here and there. She was actually 
invested by Prince William. She was appointed to the Royal Victorian Order a few years ago in 2019, I think it was, uh, which is for those who have served the Queen or the monarchy in a particular way. But the other thing to bear in mind is that as future Queen and as a representative for this country, of course, Catherine seems to me to have much more reason to employ painters if she requires them. She's got a busy life as a public role figure and role model. So she's got to look the business and flawless and as impeccable as she can, which, as we see, she, she does. You know, she's naturally beautiful, so it's not as if it's some great Her Herculean task to get her looking decent. Dragging her up. For others, it is. For others, it is. Harry, for example. Very hard to get him looking remotely attracted these days without a great deal of face tuning, photoshopping, and <laughs> all kinds of wizardry. Nutmeg at St Paul's was just some random relation come to visit, you know, for a whistle stop tour, uh, relegated to the second row, you know, over, you know, with the Yorkies, with the York girls, but even further along than them. I mean, you're in Yorkie territory. Really? The Royal Recollections. As an African-American, I'm so disappointed in Meghan and the fact that she could have had such a vast and incredible impact without shadowing William and Kate. They both got big-headed and just totally lost their focus. From what I'm hearing, she's very troubled and in some ways dangerous. Also sad that the children will most likely never have that relationship with their British family. Yes, it is incredibly sad because it was their birthright and their inheritance and it was stripped from them by the Harkles. Uh, you know, you made the point that in some ways she's dangerous. Uh, she's very troubled and dangerous, you say, yes. And the danger of Meghan and Harry that became so apparent and so explicit to me in that Oprah interview you know, a lot of people will tell you, and they are right. Before you start commenting away, hear me out first. They are right to say that Harry and Meghan are charming. They are good company. They can be good employers. I don't care what whispers you've heard and what comments and what conspiracy theories are out there. Many people, verified sources, have said that they're lovely and that they're wonderful to be around. And they're not all paid uh, this isn't all paid representation or paid publicity, by the way. There are many people, friends, confirmed people will tell you that they're just wonderful to be around. Uh, you know, old suits, castmates in suits, this kind of thing will tell you that they're fabulous. But this is precisely where the danger lies. Do you not see that? I mean, you get all these rumours about the fact they, they beat their staff and they, they're awful to their children and they're walking around like the wicked stepmother and... Although I love wicked stepmothers. But, you know, walking around, clattering around, causing all this mayhem and confusion. I mean, all this is bollocks, I've got to tell you, and balderdash. And that is not why they're, you know, some people seem to think that those who are dangerous or capable of evil misdoings walk around, you know, like Angelo, Angelina Jolie in Maleficent or something like that. Uh, that is not the danger. You know, I've oft said to this phrase, it's a Shakespeare one, you know, along the lines I'm paraphrasing, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent underneath. Uh, they look like the innocent rose, the innocent flower, and to many they are. And it, perhaps in their own minds, I'm pretty sure that they are. They think that they're the real deal. But this is the danger. This is the, this is the rub and what you saw in that open interview with the disclosure of the colour conversation you know, I get sick of referring back to it as well, my dear, so apologies, but it's one of the reasons that this entire channel sprung up, because it appalled me so much. Because I could see what the rest of the world began to see, that what Meghan and Harry had been talking about was their per perceived microaggressions. You know, it's fashionable, isn't it, to search through your entire existing life and your previous life, whether it was 10 years ago or 50 years ago, five years ago in some Facebook post or the way you were brought up or something that your Nana said to you. Uh, 
or your great grandmother might have said to you about I don't know Aboriginal tribes in Outer Mongolia 60 years to you well you know you apparently we've all picked up these microaggressions that must be addressed must be. and you know in the wake of the BLM movement and all this kind of thing when the world was particularly hypersensitive it was perfect ammunition and it was a perfect way for the Harkles to make sense of their battling with the Cambridges it was a perfect opportunity for them to shame the Cornwalls and the Cambridges on a national stage by raising this oh so pertinent issue of microaggressions where really innocent conversations were reinterpreted, reimagined through the lens of seeking out these bits of nothingness that didn't need being addressed, which was made very clear in the Queen's perfectly bitchy statement Recollections may vary. Kill them with kindness, remember. Kill them with kindness. But it was all there, plain to see, my dear. And it's that sort of thing that's dangerous. You know, I'll get comments from those of you who watch conspiracy channels, this kind of thing. Those poor children, I'm so fearful for the children. They're in such danger. They're in no danger. They're within the embrace of a loving family who cherish them. And that is the truth. I'm here to tell you the truth, not these fictions, okay? and they're happy, loved children. And I'm pretty sure that Harry and Meghan are as good a parents as anybody's. I don't know if you saw this in the press, but there was a cake, uh, another social media post, which is really another vulgarity as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, you know, nothing against the business owners. This, this is, uh, if they've been given permission to do it, then good for them. Hustle away, my dear. Hustle those buns, literally. But Claire from uh, uh, Violet Cakes or whatever it is in London provided an Amalfi lemon. I don't know how that tastes different to other lemons, but an Amalfi lemon uh, and elderflower cake was created uh, for Lilibet's first birthday party at Frogsborn Cottage. Uh, similar to the one that she created for their wedding cake, that she exchanged the plain buttercream for a strawberry buttercream. Sounds delicious, doesn't it, my dears? Decorated with flakes and uh, had, uh, sorry, flowers, flowers, and had an orange banner with the name Lilibet. You know that, I don't, this is nothing against the child and the name Lily is very pretty, but when it's not used in relation to Her Majesty and her childhood nickname, which is, I think it's so beautiful, you know, Elizabeth Lilibet, it was uh, said to be the way that Margaret Rose, her sister pronounced Elizabeth because she couldn't quite get her tongue around Elizabeth. So it became Lilibet, Lilibet, Lilibet. Uh, there's such beauty to that. But when I saw it on this orange banner on the cake, I thought, oh, it looks so ugly, doesn't it? It looks like an ugly sort of name. I mean, with an old fashioned charm, but Lilibet Diana. It doesn't really trip off the tongue in a sort of mellifluous, sweet candied way, does it? Lilibet Diana, Betty Die Die. I don't know. But you know, a, a nice tribute, I'm sure, but I didn't care for it. No shade to the child. Lily Mountbatten Windsor sounds very nice, but Lily Bet Diana Mountbatten Windsor makes my throat itch. Oh, I've digressed, haven't I? I've digressed. But the reason I brought that into the conversation was because I saw somebody, I think it was in my comment section, complaining that the birthday cake didn't look like a child's birthday cake. The poor child. <laughs> she should have a, a Disney cake or a little princess cake or some kind of cartoon character. I mean, she's one years old, my dear. I'm sure she's not going to complain that she's got one great big beautiful cake. I mean, it's still a beautiful offering and I'm sure she had all the charms of the day. So, you know, I know that I'll get some stick from nutcases out there. How dare you defend? Why are you saying nice things about them? I say nice things about them all the time because I believe in giving credit where credit's due. But it's also because I'm trying to educate some thickies out there that being dangerous doesn't mean that you walk around clouting children and giving them hideous birthday cakes and making their life a misery and being awful to everybody. That's not what it's about. The danger in, is in the fact that they are and can be these charming perfectly rational individuals but with that streak of what some might interpret as a form of insanity and for legal reasons I'm not making that claim but you know for outsiders looking in it makes you question you know what uh, how they process information in those tiny tiny minds because just that warping of information and putting it out there onto a world stage illustrates exactly why they are more than dangerous, more than dangerous, a petrifying 
imminent threat. They are a threat and that is exactly why you've seen shutdown over Jubilee weekend last week. That is exactly why you've seen batten down the hatches. They give out the message that Harry still has our love as a beloved family member, that, but that he is lost, lost to them in some ways and that he cannot be trusted. And they're not scared to give off that message to the general public because the general public are coming to that conclusion themselves because of the majestic way that the royal family dealt with all the hideousness of the past couple of years. The wisdom of the oak. The wisdom of allowing time to unravel the knots that they tied. The thought of hazelnut and nutmeg enjoying some sort of 15 minute in and out isn't something that my mind wants to countenance or go towards at all. But that is exactly the description that the press are coming out with, with regards to the meeting, the very quick formal meeting with the Queen. They are saying that it was a 15 minute in and out job and that they were given nothing but short shrift by the Queen. Uh, it was quite formal, said a source at the palace, quite formal. And that's why we saw them scurry back to the Montecito enclave tail between the legs, off to polo again to vogue and throw shapes all over and all contort and throw these vulgar shapes all over Montecito at the racket club or whatever it's called. Santa Barbara racket club. They are a racket. Linda Berg, considering that this is more than likely the last jubilee for our beloved queen, unless she reaches her oak jubilee, unless she reaches her oak. By the way, just before jubilee, I attended a celebration for Oak Apple Day, which most people in England don't know about anymore, but it's such a charming yearly celebration. May 29th, most of the celebrations take place or around then Oak Apple Day, or sometimes it's called Royal Oak Day and it commemorates the restoration of the Stuart monarchy in the 1600s, 1660, I think. Uh, and it's a wonderful sort of villagey, community-based uh, festivity. And at one time it was a public holiday, so it was quite a big deal. And it's so nice that it's still celebrated uh, in a few places up and down the country. And that was very good fun. Uh, sorry, back to your question. Uh, more than likely the last jubilee for our beloved queen, the sentimental cancerian in me rather wishes that at the end of the final balcony appearance at the jubilee, her majesty had blown a kiss to her people. It's not done, of course, and not expected at all, but wouldn't it have been marvellous? Just that one time, what do you think? Well, Linda Berg, uh, I understand exactly what you mean and why you wanted that and why, why you think it might be a good idea. And as I told you, I watched that balcony appearance through tears streaming, you know, as I was singing God Save the Queen very proudly. The tears were, the tears were streaming and, you know, I was watching the Queen intently and, you know, she has that moist look to her eyes sometimes, a slight look. And I thought, and she, but she was kind of inscrutable as usual. You couldn't really tell what her thoughts were or read them, which is why she's so marvellous. And, uh, you know, people interpret it the way they will. Oh, she looked so emotional. Oh, she looked so attached, uh, detached. Oh, she looked like she was holding back tears. Everyone puts their own spin on it. Nobody knows. And she goes from looking totally as if she might, might begin to well up on the verge of things. And then, oh, isn't that fabulous? She says, she'll throw a smile. Which, uh, is rather disarming, throws you off course, and you'll think, oh no, she was never going to cry. She was just inspecting the crowds or trying to get a good view. You cannot tell with Her Majesty, and that is what's so wonderful. But there was a moment when I thought, oh, oh my, is she actually, is a tear going to fall for the first time in her 96 years? <laughs> I know there have been other times when people have said that the Queen looked highly emotional, like she was going to cry. For example, the decommissioning of the Royal Yacht Britannia which was very beloved to her. And I saw that footage of her on the huge big screen in cinema the other week, at whatever it was, I told you I went to see Elizabeth a portrait. It showed it there. Uh, but no, tears, you still didn't really see them flowing. There's no actual confirmation that she cried. I think she's always managed to hold them back. 
in some ways. The, the most you're going to get is uh, the twinkling of a little moisture, but then that could be anything. But you suggest she could have blown a kiss to her people. Well, no. Uh, with respect, Lindeberg, for me, absolutely not. That would be so out of character for the Queen, but certainly not on a public appearance at all. And I think as much as some of us crave seeing that moment of human emotion, or, or think we want it, we think we want to see her suddenly get choked up by her, her beloved uh, population, you know, her peoples from all over the world. We think we want to see it. We really do. But it's like, you know, it's similar to in the movies or on a series. We think that we want to see Ross and Rachel, for example, get it together so badly. Or when Harry met Sally, that moment. Or, although I never wanted to see her kiss him. I thought she could have done a lot better than Billy Crystal. But you know that moment that... The, any good movie producer or director will tell you don't give it to them because uh, Sybil Shepherd and Bruce Willis moonlighting once they got it together and had some uh, fun time ratings plummeted and I'm just trying to draw a comparison I know it's not the same thing but we think or some of us might think we want to see that kind of thing in the Queen but what makes her so utterly powerful is her utter detachment and it would have been wrong to to see that. It might have felt satisfying for one minute, and then we would have thought, "Oh, that's that's not that's not the Queen. That is not Her Majesty. She is stoic, strong, and she doesn't in any way allow herself to make any of that celebration and jubilation about her. She sees it as a country celebrating the crown and the sovereign." I think obviously a part of her knows that it's about her own magic and personality. She's, she's brought to the role, but she will not allow herself to think that way on a public stage and at an event like that. You know, she is able to completely take herself out of the equation and just see herself as a public figure in a public role that is doing her service and doing her duty. Isn't it wonderful? By the time this broadcast airs, I'm sure that the noble order of the garter ceremony due to take place today will have already happened. And it's also said that Prince Andrew, who is due to attend, with, uh, is, has been dissuaded from coming to any of the public facing parts of today's ceremony. He will still be attending in private capacity to the lunch that follows the event in the Waterloo Chamber at Windsor Castle. He'll also uh, join in for the investiture in the throne room, but he will not appear in the procession or the church service. Uh, one of his spokesmen is supposed to have said that it was a personal decision of his, but the press are certainly spinning it or revealing to us that Prince William and Prince Charles in particular lobbied the Queen to say, we know you want him there, but the public don't want to see him. So they were said to have given an 11th hour intervention. And I have no idea whether or not this is true. But it seems that Prince Andrew still has the Queen's ear as her beloved son. And she still seems to have no problem with him turning up to these kind of events. But that is, you know, they've got to follow public mood at the moment or they'll be in trouble. But this order of the garter thing, I, it sounds quite kinky, doesn't it? I wouldn't mind because uh, I love wearing a little garter in the bedroom here and there, you know. And uh, I would rather like to, <laughs> to be honest, I have done. I've given the order, kiss my garter, dear, kiss my garter. Give it a good kiss and a bit of a lick while you're down there, my darling. It's all good fun. So mm, I rather like the sound of that. But yeah, it's been going on. It's an order of chivalry that was founded by Edward III, the most senior order of knighthood in the honour system. But in contrast to other appointments which are decided by the government, this particular one comes at the monarch's own discretion. She decides on the membership, uh, which include the monarch, the Prince of Wales, and up to 24 living members of this uh, Order of the Garter, or Companions as they're called, and this year we've seen C Camilla is to be installed today as a companion, and also former Prime Minister Tony Blair, who was knighted last week without any publicity, <laughs> by the Queen herself, possibly because they know that it's not that much of a popular appointment. Andrew is still a royal companion of this order.
So that hasn't been taken from him or stripped from him. There are calls for it to be taken and stripped from him. I mean, how much do they really want from this man? You know, he's not a particular favorite of mine. And I understand that he's made bad decisions. But when is enough enough for somebody who, no matter what you think, has not been charged or convicted for any crime and not even for any civil claim here in the United Kingdom? I think there needs to be some perspective but I understand that as long as this plays out in the press, which is forever, then he will only prove a distraction. Let's look at something appealing, just for a few seconds. The Wessex clan on their final day in Gibraltar. Another lovely trip it was, and Edward so resplendent in white. He is so handsome, steady Eddie. And Sophie continues to radiate joy with her own very special brand of informal regality that she does so well she's so beautiful and uh, you saw them attending the queen's birthday parade in casement square we saw charles in very handsome surroundings very very handsome surroundings in cornwall didn't we isn't that lovely surroundings handsome surroundings beefy rather beefy surroundings lucky old charles and uh, yes, they were in Cornwall, you see. What was it? The annual celebration of Cornish agriculture, food and heritage, the Royal Cornwall Show. Beautiful, beautiful Cornwall. Uh, Camilla's eyes were sparkling. Uh, they, made, they were making friends with a little doggy doggy, which was very cute. And a fun time was had by everybody. Lovely photos there. Now, I will say one thing about Prince Charles. Uh, I love his look. Uh, it wouldn't harm him to have his, uh, to do something about his bottom teeth, would it? I mean, it's not that difficult in these days to have your teeth realigned. All it takes is a few months of a uh, little plastic shield or something, whatever they use, uh, because they ain't aging well and they're going to continue moving and jostling all over the place over the next two years. And I understand that he's not vain in that way, but there's no need for a repeat performance of the Queen Mum, and, you know, I adore her look. Fondant fancy with yellow fangs. I think it's utterly endearing. For someone of her generation, uh, I thought it was iconic that she looked like she was rusting at the mouth. Because it was cute and it was endearing, and it just made you think, ah, oh, all she can eat is rusks. But with Prince Charles, you know, future king, you know, I'm not saying he doesn't have to go the full whammy, my dear, and... Uh, have a sort of Katie Price uh, affair going on, but would it really harm him to just have a little bit of, as I say, realignment of those bottom gnashes there? Because it'll make for far prettier photos of our king in future going forward. Think about it, Charlie boy. That's all I'm saying. Think about it. And remember, Camilla has got to French kiss that. Snog that, as we say here in the kin kingdom. Snoggy, 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 so make it appealing. You know, if you've got to put your tongue in something, if you've got to put your tongue in a spouse, and I'm talking about the upper orifice, my dear, you've got to put your tongue in, well, any orifice. Make that orifice as attractive as you can for your partner, you know? You've got to spare their feelings at some point, haven't you? You've got to make it inviting. Big Willie's big day's coming up, my dears. He turns 40 at the end of this week. Well, 21st of June. A fellow Cancerian like myself and like Diana. Wonderful sign, wonderful sign. Ruled by the moon, my dear. That doesn't make us lunatic, but it does make us extraordinarily sensitive, highly emotional and guarded and rather crabby. We've got little... Pincers on the side, my dear, so don't aggravate us or you'll get a nip. But we are very soft inside, my dear. Very soft inside. Very special sign we are. And obviously that was why I feel such a closeness to Big Willie. I do love Big Willie, doesn't everybody? Uh, anyway, he is turning 40. He plans, apparently, the press is saying, and they keep coming up with this kind of thing that they're saying, that he is planning to move from KP old gloomy Kensington Palace at some point, the apartment's there, to a house on the Windsor Estate, uh, where the Queen is, you know, at the moment. Uh, the rumours that they, they might take Adelaide Cottage in the future. 
Uh, they want to retain the apartment at Kensington Palace and they've got their country house, Anne Hall, of course, which is their happy place. They love old Anne Hall in Norfolk. Uh, but they want to save that up for the post-school years. Once the little kiddie coos have done with their schooling, uh, then they might retreat to Anne you know, I mean, their life as future royals are going to be all over the place, aren't they? You know, just like the Queen Sandrine and Balmoral, Windsor, uh, blah de blah blah blah. Uh, yes, so that is the, the rumour. But that is quite enough silliness for today, my dears. And in fact, that's all I've got for you. So it'll have to do. I thank you so very much for joining me in this broadcast. Have a splendid week ahead, won't you, my dears? It's Monday. It's a fresh start. How wonderful is that? Fresh start. So enjoy it. And thanks for your company. Thanks for those of you that have sent me a tip. My tip jar is in the description box below. Thank you kindly. And I will see you very soon, my dears. So take care and toodle pip.